So in this video, I'd like to continue talking about rootkits, and in particular, we'll look at a rootkit technique that's applied for user mode rootkits, and this technique is called import address table, or IAT hooking. And I kind of alluded to this technique earlier uh, in, in some of the earlier videos where I talked about how you could use hooking uh, in, order to, um, in order to kind of manipulate what code gets executed, and certainly that's something that rootkits like to do. They don't want um, re legitimate code to be executed. They try to modify execution paths so that the malicious code gets executed. So let me kind of give you um, a high-level run-through. And, and certainly, if, if you know anything about Windows uh, and Windows executables, you know that they're not entirely self-contained. So imagine that you've got like kind of a legitimate file here um, or legitimate application, and it you know it's going to be running uh, within Windows. And, and usually, what happens is that there are um, certain pieces of code that, that a lot of applications might need to run. And in order to kind of reduce the size and of a, a piece of code or an executable to improve performance and things of that nature, code that's commonly used by many different types of applications uh, is often uh, aggregated and put into special libraries. And, and these libraries can then be shared and used among different processes. Uh, so for example, imagine you are writing a, uh, an application, let, let's say an antivirus application, uh, and typically somewhere in that antivirus application you might need to find or, or to list all the files that are in a directory. And, and the way that works in Windows is uh, you, you call an API called uh, find first file. So find first file. Okay, and then you typically, once you find that file, it turns out that find first file will also give you back a handle to the next file. And you can call find next file and, and keep going. Uh, and it allows you to effectively traverse a directory and find all the files in that directory. Now, many, many applications might need to uh, traverse a file system or traverse a directory. And so uh, what Windows decided to do is, is take applications like find first file and implement them for you. And now if you ever want to do uh, a directory traversal, you can use kind of the standard library implementation of find first file. And, and the way that's, that's done is that Windows has something called a, a dynamically linked library or DLL. And I'm going to kind of write that down. So dynamically linked library. Dynamically linked library or DLL. So if you've ever seen the concept of a DLL in, in, on your file system, that's what they are. They're basically just libraries of common functions and, and, and common things you want to do that are kind of put together and uh, at, at runtime when you're actually executing, um, that, app, that particular call will be made. So for example, when, when you actually write code, uh, typically you write a piece of code, you compile that code, and during the compilation process, if you are using something from a DLL, um, a small piece of stub code will be generated for all the different functions, or what we call APIs, that are used in that DLL, and that are actually imported from that shared library. And then those stub functions are going to be located in a section of the process code that we call the import address table. So it's a big table, a really big table here, that we call the import address table. import address table and we often abbreviate that as the uh, IAT and the IAT the import address table it's basically just think of it as a data structure uh, that is available inside of portable executable files where the the operating system copies addresses of functions that are going to be imported so in other words uh, it, it is the place where if you are using a DLL there's going to be an entry typically uh, in the import address table. So in fact, there may be multiple entries in that table um, for different functions in the DL. So you might have, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, jump, uh, jump instruction, I'll explain what that means in a moment, to function one, and then you have a jump instruction to function two, and then somewhere you might have a jump instruction, JMP, to find first file. You might also have one, typically, if you're going to find first file, you may also need to find next file. So maybe there'll be a, a jump instruction for that as well somewhere in this import address table. Okay. And again, for find first file, find next file. These are basically just uh, APIs or, or functions you can use to traverse a directory. And since many applications need to traverse directories, it's a convenient way to do that. Okay. Now, what's going to happen is... Um, the way that the, the code typically executes is, is when you get to this point in the code, uh, and you'll see that in a piece of legitimate code, it'll have a call to find first file. What's going to happen is it's going to look in the import address table. 
and it's going to find out in the import address table what, what a jump instruction basically provides you with. This just tells you where to go to actually find the real code for find first file. So maybe there's actually uh, going to be there. Here's the, the kind of real code somewhere up here. Okay. And this is the actual code that finds the first file. Okay, and so you're gonna you're gonna go here, and then you're gonna find the first file, and, and, and the code's gonna kind of be all hunky dory. It's gonna execute properly. Now, what happens if a rootkit gets in the way? The rootkit is gonna try to mess with this process, and what it's gonna effectively do is it's first gonna I guess essentially load its code uh, into the actual remote process itself. It's then going to access the PE header, the portable executable header, in memory of that process. And I'm, I'm going through these steps to kind of give you an idea to impart upon you some of the non-triviality. This is not an easy thing to do, uh, even though I'm describing it at a very high level in, in very simplistic terms. There's a lot of underlying steps. And, and, and after the rootkit actually accesses the PE header, it's going to have to parse that header. It has to discover the addresses to which different import address table functions are, are mapped, uh, actually what these addresses are. And then it's going to actually change those addresses. So imagine instead of, um, it's going to go in here and it's going to change the address. Instead of going to the real find first file, it's going to change the address to a special rogue version of find first file that it's creating. Okay. So imagine it's, it's now kind of replaced the instruction and now it's going to go to a rogue version. And here's the rogue version. Okay, the rogue version might be here. And this is the, the bad, this is the bad version of find first file. It's a bad version of find first file. And now, um, because the address has been changed, instead of going to the legitimate version of find first file, execution is going to go to the bad version of find first file. Okay? Now, in the process, what, what's going to happen next is, is typically, uh, when, when a rootkit writes a bad version of find first file, what's the first thing the bad version is going to do? Well, it's actually going to call the good version, <laughs> find out the results, the real results, okay? Get the execution, come back here, and then it's going to figure out how to modify those results. So it's going to basically call the original, okay, call the original, and then possibly modify. Now, why would it want to modify? Well, for example, let's say um, this is an antivirus product and it's trying to find, uh, it's trying to find all the files on the file system to scan. Uh, well, then what the rootkit can do is say, it intercept all of this kind of mess with find first file, mess with find next file, etc. cetera. Uh, and then um, if it sees itself on the list, let's say it sees that, hey, wait a minute, this is, this is the rootkit file. It can go ahead and just remove itself from that list effectively, just modify the results. And so what the, what the actual application will see, it will see all the results from finding files except for the result that contains the rootkit. Okay, so the rootkit can effectively hide its own presence in the system. Okay, hopefully that made some sense. Uh, and, and this is, you know, this is a pretty powerful technique. I mean, you, you, you can use it for really all sorts of things, not just, you know, finding files. I mean, you can, you can use it for, uh, for, for registry entries. You can use it for, for various other things. And, and I, you know, I, I won't go into kind of all the details and, and all the nuances, but I think you know, it's worth pointing out that it's a very powerful technique that, that a lot of rootkits try to use in, in, in terms of being able to really hide, hide their presence from uh, from the operating system, but really from, from an attacker, or, or rather from a legitimate piece of software that's trying to find uh, kind of where it is. Okay? Um, so the next thing, I, I just want to maybe briefly touch upon some of the, the limitations of this type of an approach. I mean, it, it's, it's a good approach, but there are some limitations to it, and I think it's, it's worth talking about some of the limitations up front. Um, so the first big limitation of, of this type of an approach where you are... Uh, uh, you know, trying to find, uh, try, try, really trying to, to, uh, to modify uh, execution by hooking the IAT is that um, you have to deal with something called uh, delay imports. So um, let me talk, talk about some drawbacks. So there are delay imports. And really, all delay imports are is that in, in some situations, DLLs or dynamic linked libraries, they're kind of linked at the last possible minute. They're not always linked at upfront, but they're they're linked um, 
I mean, actually, they're always linked, but they're not necessarily loaded until the actual function is function call is made that uses them. And, and, and this really is, is um, you know, kind of the last possible minute in which you need to use it. And so as a result, uh, there's no real window of opportunity for somebody who's trying to hook the import address table. You, you really are just kind of waiting uh, until there's, there's no other opportunity for, for someone to do something. Okay. Uh, the second thing that I want to mention in terms of uh, in terms of the IAT is that you also have to worry about situations in, 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 in which the DLLs are loaded manuals, manually, so manual loading of DLLs. And by this I mean there are like certain Windows calls, like for example the, the load library call or the um, uh, the get proc address call. And if you if you actually load a DLL with one of those two calls, then there actually will be no entry in the IAT. In other words, there's going to be no point in the IAT where uh, you can actually find that particular uh, library, uh, that particular API being located. So there's nowhere for the actual rootkit to go ahead and modify. Okay, so the rootkit has no no recourse that it can use if it were trying to use an IAT hook in that particular scenario. Uh, and of course, in general, and, I, and I'll mention this in other videos as well. Um, the, the other challenge of just hooking in general and, and, and IAT import IAT hooking is that it, it's a bit easier to detect a hook like this because it, you can kind of figure out where to look. And if you know where to look um, for a hook, they become a bit more uh, evident because there's an actual trace, there's actual something actually being modified, but but in, in a way that the presence that presence of that modification can be detected. Okay, so I'm going to stop this video right here. Hopefully, this made some sense and you got a good flavor of how import address table or IAT hooking works.